So Polar Bear Race 4, uh, my name's Drew Mitchell. I'm the manager at North Seals Vancouver. Um, so I just want to start, you know, I just want to start about like the first leg. I kind of go leg to leg uh, during this debrief um, and just things that I saw and things that I, I think, um, you know, I, I recorded and tried to catch some, some different maneuvers and different things people were doing. Um, so the start, the, the first, the first start I actually missed, I'm not sure what divs that are, but there was two different starts. And the first one I missed, I was actually at Whistler for a Christmas holiday or a family Christmas holiday. And I drove down that morning, the roads were really bad. So I missed the first start by about five minutes, uh, but I was lucky enough to be out there for the first start of the next division. And um, there was a general recall in that first start. The second start, the wind shifted, if everyone remembers, heavily to the south. Um, and if you were in that first start, I wish I had two cameramen on my boat because as I was filming the second start and there was that big like 90 degree shift to the south, um, there was all the boats had most of the boats from the other division already had rounded QC and were heading down. Some of them were heading to the bell buoy, other ones were heading around a freighter and they were kind of with the kites up heading in a kind of like an easterly, a southeasterly. And then that it really banged around to the south. And uh, I, I I wish I was filming both and I couldn't stop my filming of the, of the start of the second race and my positioning, but there was lots of kites flying out the backside of the boats. They looked like a lot of flags uh, back there. People were trying to maybe dry their kites off. Um, but I think when that switch happened, um, I think a few people maybe held the kites on too long and it actually happened really quickly and, and the breeze was up a little bit. Um, so that's really hard to to keep your angle in a, in a big kite like that uh, when you're on the edge. And, and I think a lot of people are having issues taking it down at that angle. Um, so if that's some one of your teams, maybe you guys should maybe have a little bit of a debrief and chat amongst each other about like when a significant shift in the wind happens like that with a spinnaker up, what is the processes on your boat to take that spinnaker down so you don't end up losing it behind the boat or losing time and, and, um, and not making it down the race track you know you'd have to either bear off and get the kite down safely or you'd have to have a good technique and, and your crew ready to take a kite down on a hard reach which is which is always very difficult um another comment i saw was like the pin end uh was the best place to start on the second uh start for the for the second div or what, what i guess it's the first div or first and second or whatever and it ended up and it was tough to tell because there was a big wind shift um but uh, the boats that started down near the pin basically stayed and stayed kind of licked up a little bit or had pressure in their sails and could basically sail just cracked off, maybe even close hauled, depending on where the wind was um, to the windward mark. So I found some of the boats that started off and the boat had like, you know, you'd always think that maybe I'll start off the boat, and just bear off and kind of cruise over top of the other boats. But unfortunately, as soon as you, especially when you got up near the, near the mark, especially if you started really close to the boat where the probably the boats to lured were keeping you up a little bit, you ended up cracking off the spinnaker and your speed, or your head sail and your speed really slowed down. The boats that were kind of underneath kind of squirted up and through. Um, so that's what, what kind of I saw. So luckily enough, I was there for the first start and I'm just gonna play this one. One thing that I thought was kind of interesting here, you can see Legacy, they were kind of early to the start and they, you know, good thing is they recognized and made a pretty quick move to turn back around and restart. I thought that, that that was a pretty slick move there. And they're kind of setting up um, again, which is a very difficult maneuver. Um, the, the, you know, there are boats that notice that they're really too, too early to the start line. So they're almost like beam reaching down the line, which ended up giving the race committee a pretty hard time to see everyone down the pin. And that's probably the reason that they had the general recall. But if you look up at the line of boats, I think it was a pretty good start by the majority of the sailors or the race boats on this course. Um, just the race committee, you know, probably decided that they couldn't figure out who was over early and who wasn't. And it was fair, you know, the, the fair part was to, to re redo the start. So that was start one, general recall. Uh, so here's start two. I actually, I like to always film down the pen. I just find it as a better angle than the, than the boat. And I try to stay right at the pen and line up with the orange flag. Uh, this day I had my driver, uh, bail on me in the last minute. So I was out there driving and filming, which, um, I've done a few times, but I'm, I'm still trying to, um, still trying to figure it out a little bit. Um, so my positioning wasn't perfect. And 
my screen got really wet here. Uh, so I cleaned it and came right back on as the start. So the start happened about two seconds ago. You can see down there, um, that is John and, um, and Phoenix uh, started and they were, you know, I think that they were one, two around or, or maybe two through one, three around that windward mark, which was a good start. I think that midline start by Occam's was also, you know, good. All the people at the boat had, you know, you guys were all fighting for it and had really, no one was too far off. I know Jason had an issue um, with the jib that didn't go up. So he was off, off if you want to watch that again. He was off in the background there, off to the right, just trying to get his jib fixed. Uh, but I think everyone was at the start line and the majority of boats were at the start line, which is good. I just think the boats at the lower end ended up and ended up paying off. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. So like high road or low road. Uh, so rounding at QC. Um, I just have one video of the rounding here when a bunch of boats are actually rounding together. And when you're basically like, you know, uh, you're like basically in a line up here, as soon as you jive and it's a long distance away and you're, and you're reaching at this point. So you kind of, you know, you, when you ever, most of the time when you round um, a mark like this um, and you're reaching, technically reaching at this point down to your next mark, no one knew it was going to free up like it did, but you know, you pick the high load or the ro low road or, or, or you point right at it. And for whatever reason you put in your tactics, if you think it's going to free up, you know, you probably want to stay the low road. So if the wind backs and if you think it's going to go forward, you might pick the high road uh, so that you can come down so you can still stay maybe on the on the run line. It's a tough decision for a long leg like that, especially how the wind backed. Um, but as you choose the low road or the high road, you're going to have boats, especially on a short upwind leg like this, you know, maybe a, a boat that's slower than you had a better start going around the wind mark, then you have to get past them. Um, so there was a couple duels that I saw down in, which I thought were kind of cool. It's always fun watching two boats kind of deke it out. Um, let's watch this video and just see some of the roundings, you know, um, all pretty good roundings, but you can kind of tell some boats are going straight up, um, and kind of protecting that windward side. Some boats are just kind of going straight. You can tell it's raining there as, as in the video. Um, and, you know, and the some boats are kind of staying almost, almost out of like a VMG or, or pointing directly. So kind of the middle road, um, what ended up working, um, you know, I'm not, I, I think the, the, you know, it really depended, but I'll go on to this later, but eventually down near the dolphins, um, the breeze really got a little lighter. So if you, if you didn't have to, you know, heat up to get further into the dolphins and it got lighter, one thing I kind of liked here was most boats were kind of beam reachy here but if you see john here on legacy uh, i don't know if you guys can see my cursor or not but legacy is going around the mark right now and he kind of does this wide and tight turn which gives him allowance to choose either low mode or high mode um and and i just think that that he actually it looks like he was almost scared he's about to hit the mark there but he he made a nice round turn so he could go high or if you want to do it get bear off if you end up doing the, the tight and wide, there might be a boat that gets inside of you. And then that, that, that means you can't go to the high road anymore. So you're, you're going to be stuck on that low road. Um, so I just thought that that was a pretty good maneuver by John, just to give himself options once he got around that mark. Um, another thing I noticed here, and I kind of took two pictures is that reaching leg um, before it started backing uh, getting your sheet outboard is very important, and I'm not sure if they have the ability to, to do this on Occam's or not. But uh, Phoenix uh, did it right away, and they, you know, they Phoenix has a lot of talented sailors that have done a lot of miles around the Pacific Northwest, and um, they immediately were outboard sheeting their jib, which allows your the 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 foot and the leech tension to be a little more equal than if you're if you look over here on the right picture here. You can see Occam's that, that isn't sheeting outboard, they're sheeting to their, their Genoa or their jib track. And you can see how open the top of the sail is relative to uh, Phoenix. So what you do is if you sheet outboard, you close that top of the sail. Like basically that whole, almost half that sail isn't working right now, it's just spilling air. So if you were to outboard sheet it, you sheet on a little bit, that's gonna close the top of the sail and power up the boat. Um, looked like they were hiking pretty hard there. So if they were to power up the jib, um, you know, you might need to drop the travel a little bit or depower the main a little bit, but outboard sheeting and using that jib, I bet you you'll have less weather helm and you're, you're going to be able to steer much easier uh, with the jib powered up and pulling your bow down a little bit. 
Um, but as I've been talking about, it was a tricky leg from QC to Belbuy. Like, you know, some of the best tacticians in the world, I bet you couldn't, wouldn't have guessed. And you can only kind of, kind of deal with the conditions that you have in front of you. If you're further back in the fleet, something that I always recommend is looking forward and watching what's happening to the other boats. But boats like Occam's and Phoenix are right up at the front of the fleet. You know, Phoenix went from jib to code zero to kite. And um, Occam's didn't have a code zero, maybe not had a code zero on board. So they just went from jib to kite. And they ended up sneaking away once the kite went up. You know, it's a bit of a lighter boat, a larger asymmetrical. Um, but, it, you know, seeing those things as some of the boats in the back, that kind of gives you telltales um, what's happening ahead. So you can kind of start planning and start making a, you know, a tactical decision or a strategy, strategy decision on what, what's coming next and what you're going to do. What, if you're going to do a sail change, if you're going to go up, if you're going to go down. Um, so it started off in reach and it ended up with a run. Um, some duels on the way down. So we talked about that. I just wanted to, and I'm going to have a video after this, but I just wanted to um, talk about, you know, like a duel or possibly getting over top of someone. One thing is you don't want to broadcast that you're going to do it. So you don't want to be like, like, you know, say if you're a tactician speaking very loudly saying, all right, we're about to roll these guys um, or putting the bow up really early, really fast. Um, that's another way. Just, just try to be a little secretive that you're going to be past them. Maybe start go like, you know, start further away, put the bow up, you know, a degree or two to start getting that separation so that they don't really feel like you're being, you're going to be like right on their breeze. Uh, make sure you can get over them, especially if you give yourself uh, enough room to weather him or her, um, probably a her if it's a boat, but um give enough room to weather so like i'll show you the video like basically it's a boat length so if you pass a boat by over a boat length or boat length and change chances are they're not going to be able to get up and luff you uh remember you're racing the fleet and not only one boat so if there is this is for the boat that's getting passed if there is a boat that's faster than you and it's trying to go over top of you um if you think about the if it's if it's going by you pretty quickly um just let it go by because you heading up and getting into a luffing match against one other boat when you're racing a fleet and sometimes they might not even be in your division is going to be is going to be more painful than the 10 seconds that they're going to be on your breeze and, and quickly pass you they want to get by you too and they're usually worried about you coming up at them so they just want to get out of there and get back down to their vmg angle or whatever angle there there is to the next mark uh, just getting past you so just if you are getting past sometimes it is worth it just let the big big dogs or the bigger boats get past you the faster boats sometimes they don't have to be bigger uh slip past you and um and, and just take take you know take the pain now instead of instead of luffing and then you know at the same time if if you're in tough competition if it's the fourth race of a series and that boat is if they beat you that day they win the series or or come third in the series you come fourth whatever it is or they're real competitors. If they're overpassing you and they're not giving you enough room, feel very free to put them up. Um, you know, next time you, you end up in the same position, they're probably going to do the same thing back to you. But, you know, in competitive spirit, if you do it properly and follow the rules, it's something that it can happen in sailing. And I've seen it done before. Um, got really light near the dolphin. So, and there was like this little bit of a chop near the dolphin. So it was, the wind was dying and then it was kind of like, there was this little swell. So the boats were really slow. So, um one you know one uh, you needed to start making like you were you needed to change gears and you wanted to one thing i you know i saw a boat or two do was ease the halyard or come into the cunningham on the main so usually you have them off going downwind but even a little more in that light stuff just to get the sail a little bit deeper um you know adjust your cunningham uh outhaul uh maybe even boom vang so those are you know those are ability those are sail controls you can change your gears with uh make sure you adjust the weight on the boat so especially in light air, you know, you might need to get to that leeward side to help the sail kind of fill. You definitely don't want a windward heel. Um, and the trimmer, uh, the spinnaker trimmer needs to be focused. So that, that part of the race, if, um, you know, your spinnaker trimmer was having lunch or whatever, or, or, um, or was out to lunch, um, you know, it would be difficult in those light conditions to really, you know, make progress or be as efficient as possible. And, and in that light stuff, having a spinnaker trimmer that's really on, that's not over trimmed, is constantly, so if it's symmetrical, moving the pole and the kite, it's probably up near the forestay, I mean, and the sheet. Um, if you're asymmetrical, definitely not over sheeting. That is the biggest thing. But also, if you let it out too much, if it collapses, you have to head way up and restart the, 
the flow on the sale, which is, you know, very slow. So that spinnaker trimmer, like that was, that was game on during those, those light conditions here, the dolphins and everyone kind of compressed. So there was like lanes where you were jiving out. So it was, it was a time the spinnaker trimmer needed to be focused to make sure their boat was making as much progression to that lured, lured mark as possible. Um, so I caught this like last minute. I was actually driving the other way. I was like, oh my God, they're about to do it. So I turned around and I just caught the end of it. And you can even see like I'm still driving the boat back towards them. Uh, but you can see here, uh, this is Tom and they were passing a boat in another division. And, you know, they started early right now. If that other boat decided to spin up, there's no way that they could get to Tom. I missed Tom was Tom and, and his crew did an amazing job. They kind of came up and it was time to make the pass. And they were almost like, you know, Tom knows how to drive this boat really well. And I could tell in these conditions because he had the, he was right over. And, you know, if he didn't have a good trimmer or if he didn't, you know, um, drive properly in the main sheet as well, you know, it the butter would have cavitated and he would have wiped out. But soon they got, they were kind of on their ear there. Then they came down, they made a good pass. Wasn't too painful for this boat. You know, they only were over top of the wind for about 10 seconds. And then they were both back onto their own race course. Um, so I just wanted to show that video. I thought it was a pretty good maneuver by, um, by Sarah and Defty and the team. Um, so this is a video of Occam's here. There's, um, I'm actually going to turn the audio on in the, this one. And so this is just a windward dose. So if anyone um, doesn't know what that is, basically on an asymmetrical, uh, if you want to get it down, uh, on the windward side, you pull the spinnaker around and then you drop it down. It's actually pretty easy. You can see it kind of falls against the jib, but here the kite's still up and they're starting to turn up. So what happens is the kite actually blows back into the spreader. And so I'm going to turn this off and I, I'm not sure if the volume works or not, but there's communication going on. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know if you can hear it. You, you, I don't know. You can um, you can hear the bell buoy, um, but what was happening there? And uh, the skippers noticed that they that the kite was caught in the spreaders there, and he instead of you know I, I don't know I've seen it before I've been on boats before. Oh my God, the spinnaker is going to rip! Oh my God, like start screaming and yelling. It was a very calm communication. Hey everyone, stop! Can't stop. You know how you're how you're okay. The kite's caught on the uh, spreader. Please hoist the kite back up slowly. Hoisted the kite back, hoisted the kite back up slowly, and then uh, once the kite was hoisted back up and was out of the spreader, they were able to pull it down, and that prevented them from ripping the kite. That prevented them going up wind with the kite spreader. Um, I just thought it was a very calm, cool, collected um, kind of teamwork there, uh, led by the skipper, and the kite ended up coming down successfully and and not back into the loft for repair. Um, so I just thought that that was good. And communication on boats, I always find being calm and collected. There are times when you need to yell to be heard, say if it's really windy or if um, whatever the situation is. But at the same time, staying calm and collected, you might need to raise your voice to be heard. Some boats are larger. There is, you know, wind is noisy. At the same time, if you stay calm, calm and collected and kind of walk everyone through the process, if you see something that's happening that you don't want to, like there where Mark saw, um, it usually ends up with a better result. Uh, so leeward mark rounding. So, uh, you know, first of all, these are just some points I wanted to write down about leeward mark roundings and kind of what I think about going into one. Uh, so making sure you don't hit the mark. First of all, if you, you know, if you hit the mark, you end up having to do a 360. Um, and especially if you're going around a bell buoy, you know, you're probably going to do a 360. Then you have to, you know, go take it, take the boat out and take it to the yard and get some, get some paint work done. Um, thinking about the current. So I, I grew up on the other coast and learned to race in different conditions and in the Pacific Northwest rounding marks and sometimes you even look at marks or look at crab traps and see the current how quickly it's moving so putting that into your game plan when you're going into a mark knowing if you're the current's coming in or if it's going against the buoy is very important because it will help you make a more or a better rounding uh so you, first of all you don't hit the mark or you don't end up sailing too far away from the mark because the current's dragging you away you end up starting your your turn a little bit earlier if the current's pushing you out um, and a little later if it's pulling you in. Um, so wide and tight, that's a classic one. So the J approach or fish hook, uh, similar to what John did on the upwind, but on the downwind, uh, a little bit different. You come in and it's, it's kind of like a 
fish hooks or J approach or you're wide and then you come in tight. You want to be at the mark right beside it with at basically full speed with your mainstay and your jib all the way in fully trimmed. If not, maybe 90% trimmed and 90% speed, but, but not giving anyone room to get on the inside and making sure your sails are trimmed proper and, and your boat's up to speed. Keeping kite up as long as possible. So I think the way that these conditions were, and you'll see in these videos, it was a little bit difficult um, to judge how early you needed to take down that kite to get around the mark. Um, you know, I think you'll see in the video, I think four, five, six boats took their kites down early, and then one kite took the kite down late. Saying that, you know, getting the kite down early is always a safer move, but at the same time, in PHRF racing, you're racing for seconds, so every second you have that kite up is going to be a benefit for you in the long run, as long as you get it down and have a proper rounding. Um, make sure you do not over trim your jib when heading up. So when you're going around that mark, a lot of people, um, and it's a very common thing, you know, head down grinding that sail in. What you really want to do is actually be under trimming that jib and getting your mainsail trimmer to be working that main, and that main will pull you up with CECLR. And the jib actually pulls your bow down. So you want to be slightly under trimmed until you get up to that close hauled course. And then you want to probably pull into 90, 95% till you get up to full speed and then final trim once you're at full speed. Um, another thing is have a game plan for after the mark. So, you know, if you're, you know, not just like, okay, we want to go up the beach or we want to go, uh, you know, we want to go over to West Vancouver and then tack. Uh, like if you're third, say if you're coming to a mark and you're the third boat and there's two boats rounding around, rounding out of you, you know, the chances are there, the first one's probably going to tack. Second one's probably might tack right behind it or, or slightly above, you know, you probably don't want to turn that mark and attack right away. You probably want to give yourself a lane. So you want to, you want to make sure that your crew knows that you're going to be holding that tack for a little while. So make, have a game plan, communicate it to the team, um, and then try to execute it. Um, so you can see here, this is a um, bunch of boats coming down a lure mark. Um, I'm kind of positioned in this angle to try to show the distance from the mark. I actually kind of almost get in the way to tell you the truth. The boat, boat had, had pretty good rounding. So you can see there, Stellar J just had the kite down. Um, I don't know what boat behind it is. I think that might be Frank going kite down there. Um, you know, kept it up a little bit longer. You can see how much slower the boats get as soon as the kites go down. Um, Stellar J's got, I think, got inside room here. So they're going to have a good rounding. We got a cricket there in the back, um, kind of sneaking in. You can all you can see how how much those waves are affecting the speed of the boat. It's not that flat water English Bay racing. So really good job by Stellar J going right into a. Oh, I thought they were going into attack there. My apologies. Uh, maybe something happened. I think they were thinking about it. Uh, but really good rounding there. They didn't allow the um, you know uh frank to kind of push them up frank was good he gave them room one thing about with frank there you know you might have been you might have wanted to try to fight for that inside spot a little bit earlier especially with the bigger kite um but saying that you know both boats had good roundings and got around the mark fine so this i think this is a good example of of kites maybe coming down a little bit early so we've um we've got the two j109s here battling it out and um, we got a windward dose. Okay, so that's um, that's good because chances are the next mark that they're going around is to port, so the the kites can be on the right side. Saying that there is a long um, a long leg back, so you can always rerun your sheets. Uh, then we have uh, a leeward dose, and it looks like they blew the tack line, kind of brought it in through the back of the boat. That's a that's a good way to get down a big spinnaker. Um, but you can kind of see here with the with the unsettled sea state. Um, we've got Jason coming in on Excalibur and he's kind of keeping that kite up a little bit longer. It looks like the jib's up. It's, or at least going up because you can see it's starting to, um, starting to affect the front edge of his sail. Um, and he, you know, he doesn't pass the boat uh, on this rounding, but he definitely brought the gap a lot closer. There was definitely seconds gained keeping this kite up. Um, you know, both boats had good roundings once they got to the mark, but you expect that, you know, they have their upwind sails up, um, both very competitive Pacific Northwest boats. Um, maybe Jim, Jim slightly under trim there, but it is it, blowing it off. He's going right into attack. So not a big deal, you know, not a big deal at all. Second rounding good, nice and tight. You know, these guys are staying as close to the bell buoy as they can. Um, going a little bit further, 
and then tacking. So not tacking, you know, you don't want to be in dirty air rounding that mark. Pretty important to um, make sure you have a clean lane, especially like, you know, there was still a lot of south in this breeze or, or you know, a little bit. So, you know, you're, you're pointing pretty much at Vancouver when you rounded it, maybe a little bit towards Stanley Park. But chances are you are going to be on that attack for a little while. So making sure you have a clear lane, you're not sailing into a competitor's dirt or having to sail a high lane, high and slow for a long period of time with, or having to tack because you sail in there. And if I was kind of talking there, but if you see right at the end, and I don't think Jason had tacked yet, but Jason actually sails quite a bit way further up and gets himself a nice clear lane so that he has, he has a nice lane that he can sail the low mode if he needs to go faster waves or, or sail in standard VMG mode. Um, but yeah, I thought that was that was a good rounding by all threes. Maybe the J19s could have put kept the kite up a little bit longer. Um, so this is Nicholas here, um, and I, I didn't get their kite dose. I did get a really good kite hoist uh, later on in the in the videos, but good rounding. Um, I'm not sure what happened here, but I think what happened maybe there was a wind shift, or, or, or Nick didn't know how how far east the breeze had gone. So you kind of see, or maybe they got someone got stuck on the tiller or something, but they the boat basically completely stopped because they had stopped their tack halfway through crossing the wind. And the, the wind actually was still on the leeward side of the sail, so it was back winding into the rig. Um, good thing it's a 3DI north sail, very tough, tough sails, not only fast. Um, but um basically Nick just he, he noticed what was happening, which was really good, just bared off, got that kite full. And I mean, head sail full, he probably had to sail a little bit lower coming out of that because the boat really stalled up so he probably still a little lower got his speed back and then probably came back um into you know proper close haul position with uh proper you know boat speed um but it was a good rebound after a bit of an error that's that's what i wanted to say there um so just two quick comments on these guys um there was like you can see and sorry about the camera angle i was probably trying to back up um so again, I think the, the, the kite was down a little bit early. Um, I actually, during this, I never actually got the rounding. Um, I try to keep my videos, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. And they had the kite down. And, and if you can see here, the biggest thing here, and it's okay to get your kite down early if, if that's what you think is necessary, but the jib was super far in. So, so what that's doing is now you don't have a downwind sail up and, and you're almost in an upwind position with your head sail. So what I would do is, if you end up being far away like that, whatever reason, I've done it a million times, getting that kite down earlier than you wanted. I usually get a crew member to almost go up on the clue of the Genoa and hold it out as far as you can and just try to turn it into a downwind sail and try to get it, uh, try to get it out, uh, out past the lifelines um, and try to catch a little bit of air. Um, so I just think maybe maybe working on getting that that Genoa out not in when you're trying to get down on that leeward mark because it's a tough one if you get it down at that at that wind angle to keep the boat speed up. Um, you know, actually, I thought this one was the best approach to the windward mark, but unfortunately for John, the the kite didn't come down. And and on that 92, those kites are wide, eh? Like look how wide that kite is relative to the other ones coming down. It's like um, it's like a pumpkin. Um, so you can see, and you can see the kite starting to collapse due to the jib coming up, but he's, he's, he's holding on to it as long as possible. So he, he's held it on longer than any other boat. So now he's trying a windward douse. And what happens here is boom, the kite refills right here. And the crew member, and I bet you almost any crew member, won't be strong enough to pull that around. Um, unless you got an Arnold Schwarzenegger or someone on the boat. But it's very difficult. So what happens is, and John did a very good job. Some people would just some skippers and will just turn up hill and start yelling at their crew to get the kite down while it's flogging. Don't recommend that. Do exactly what John did. This is a beautiful new kite. Um, you, you wait. You actually wait until the until and you know you can almost see him bear off a little bit to try to take the pressure over the kite. That allowed the crew member to get it to the windward side, get it down. Then you can head up. You know, don't head up with don't head up wind with the kite unless you want to damage it um, or and not be you know have an unhappy bow bow man. Uh, one thing that he could have done there, and, and I think it should get into a playbook, is just dousing it on the leeward side would have been much easier. And then rerunning the sheets uh, for your next rounding, you do have an upwind leg and then and then a reaching leg. You don't know if it's going to turn down wind or not, but chances are this next leg was upwind and it was a pretty long, 
way. So you would be able to redo your sheet sometime during this next leg. And it would have prevented that windward um, sheet just not being able to get in due to it refilling. But yeah, keeping up the kite is good. And, and you know, sometimes one thing is you need to push the boundaries sometimes. And you know, everyone's out there racing, but we're still all learning. And sometimes you need to actually push it to figure out how far you can push it or, or what issues happen when, when you do end up that close to a mark and your kite is still up. And if you don't do it, if you're constantly taking the kite down early and just going in there, it's pretty easy just to round a mark with your head sails up. But, you know, pushing yourself and learning, um, you know, how to do that properly that close, it's not a bad thing. So I, I applaud John for keeping it up that long. And I'm sure next time though, they'll have it figured out. So again, coming in this leeward mark, um, kite down there, boats are slow, right? So, you know, having a big, you know, 0 0.75, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ounce kite up in the air is pretty important to keep the boat moving in these conditions. You know, we've got one boat out ahead here. Um, looks like the dash, maybe. Yeah, I think it's the dash. And um, and then we've got two other, looks like the, the, the boat ahead right now with the red and black kite has room on, um, that looks like Jason Saunderson coming in. And um, so Jason's giving him right away. I probably would have slowed Jason down and came in right beyond his stern. The reason for that is if you're on the stern, you have ability to tack away. Right now, uh, Jason's, the, Jason's the bigger, faster boat. So he's gonna be rounding outside of this boat. So he's stuck in that position on the outside. He will not be able to uh, tack until he either sails past him and it has clearance to tack, or if he slows his boat down and tacks behind him. So he's basically letting that windward boat um, lead him out or, or decide what, what the plan is unless he tacks. So I always recommend if you're in that position, try don't be on the outside of the wheel, try to slow your boat down and, and round right behind the stern of the boat ahead of you. Sometimes the boat ahead of you has a bowed rounding and next thing you know, you're the inside boat. Um, so this is the, uh, the J120 coming down. I really like the, uh, the artwork on the kite, the face looks, looks pretty cool. Pretty funny. Um, you can see here, so possibly the jib went up or was unfurled a little earlier. My zoom went a little aggressive here. I had the audio on, you can probably hear some swear words. Um, but, uh, so the, the, the jib came out and you could tell they were trying to hold on to the kite as long as possible which is what you want to do but i think that jib was really affecting the kite's ability to stay full um see here lure dose really good job they grabbed the foot looks like the um the pit guy was allowing the halyard down quick enough you know not not too quick that it's in the water doesn't look like they're fighting the kite either kites down ready to go you know probably as soon as that, that kite gets down you're gonna start pulling that that um that spinner grid maybe have the uh, the pole line unlocked and the spinnaker could bring the pole right in with it. Looks like that's exactly what's happening right there. Great job. Um, and good rounding. One thing here though, it looks like the jib's a little too far in for the point of sale. I'd probably have that jib off a little bit more and main on a little bit. A main on a little bit more jib off a little bit and the boat will come up a little bit easier. But yeah, overall, great, great job getting that kite down around the mud. So here comes another dose. It looks like the jib is coming up. And as you notice, everybody, that the, that the especially at this hotter angle coming in, that, that loft of the sail is going to be hard to fly with a head sail up. So making sure you have the, you know, you don't put the head sail up too early. So you're going to have to take the, you're going to have to take the kite down. They're doing a windward drop. Great job. Okay. Kite kind of, you know, that's a tough one. Kite kind of randomly fills through the back of the sail. Um, they're getting it down, which is good. Um, right now, I would, as, a, as a you know, I'd probably be chatting with the Genoa trimmer to try to get that head sail in, uh, because those are big head sails and that clues pretty far out. So you're probably going to be able to pull it a little bit, but you're gonna have to grind it. And there's no way by the time you get to the market, you'd be able to grind that sail all the way in, even if you started right now. Um, so you can see here the kite's down, which is great, but the head sail is still out. Um, but you know, kite got down, they got around the mark, um, a little bit more head tail in, they would have had that, they would have nailed that one. Um, 
we got two and these, these guys are kind of coming in from a different angle than the other boats um, and a different jibe. So, so the boat on the left had taken their kite down already. Uh, boat on the right is kind of holding on uh, as long as they can. You know, it's always scary being that front boat taking the kite down with the, with the back, with the boat behind you coming in with the kite up, especially if you're entering the three boat length zone. You're hoping you're getting in that three boat length zone before, before they get to your stern. Looks like these guys did that successfully. Um, we'll just watch the rounding here. So nice, that's a nice wide, wide rounding there, wide and tight. You know, they're not going next to the mark. Good job. Head sails getting across, kites getting put away. You know, good job. Head sails slightly under trimmed. Yeah, not bad. I'd be coming in on it pretty quickly there. Looks like they're they're doing a good job. Maybe not quick enough, but that's the big head sail. So that, that, that was okay. They still got their kite up a little bit. It looks like they have an issue maybe with a knot in the halyard. Uh, so the kite's kind of flying out the back. It's kind of like a kind of like a sea anchor in the air. Um, another boat rounding here. I think this is the J30. Um, you know, good rounding there. They're getting that head sail in. Mainsail was in, so good rounding there, guys. Coming from a different angle than most. Um, so that was all the downwind stuff. Um, I think good job, everyone. Just wanted to, I think, you know, getting the kite down earlier is usually better, is the safer play than later, but, you know, maybe try to get out there and push a little bit more. Um, and wide and tight is pretty important and making sure you have a game plan once you get around that mark. Um, this is one of the seldom, like I took tons of pictures while I was heading from the bell buoy to um, the barge. Uh, the barge was kind of uneventful, but um, I did take one video and, and I really like this video because these guys are all, you know, it's cold out there and they're all sitting there on the rail. So I, I, you know, I applaud Thursday's child. The one thing is, and I want to point anyone out, but if you can see the gentleman at the very back, um, if you look so that you have your bow guy, then you have a little bit of a hole and then you have your blue, blue, blue jacket person. I would be moving that person at the very back to, and I used to be that person on a boat I race. I used to sit on a chair back there. Um, but I would be moving that guy up into that position. If you're a tactician, you know, you could pop in the back if you need to see if you're picking a laner right now. But right now they're just kind of straight lining it up towards the barge and getting that weight on the rail, I think is pretty important. The boat is, has a really good heel angle, uh, but getting the, especially the weight out of the back of the boat and getting it on the rail over the keel, I think would help a little bit. Um, saying that, I really like how everyone's on the rail here. You can see the mainsail trimmer. Everyone's right beside each other, uh, looking pretty good. So good, great job, Thursday's child. Uh, the last two legs. So we had the rounding of the barge was uneventful. So I didn't really take any pictures or videos when I was there. Um, it, there was a long reach leg. Um, so one thing during the long reach leg is you know, your chances are, and if you're, if you're not one of the front boats, you know kites are going up. So everyone's rounding it. You can see the kites going up. So you should have your kites sorted and ready to go up as soon as you round that. Um, so maybe, you know, run the tapes, make sure it's not going to go up an hourglass on you um, and ready to hoist a QC. Um, so when you round QC, you could jibe set, set then jibe, or set and then sail straight. Um, and then jibe for the finish once you get down or, or jibe before the finish. But like what worked, what I thought worked and, and what I saw was, and you can kind of see it in these videos is, is rounding and it kind of got a little light there and it always does under um, Stanley Park like that. But if you kept sailing straight, it seemed to be more wind over on the right side, like right side heading down towards the finish line. And you also like a jibe set, unless it's done perfectly and, and there's huge advantage over the left. You know, it, it, it's a big turn on the boat. The boat really slows down. And when you're coming in like a reach like that and you're reaching and you basically are almost doing like a 180, it's a huge turn for the boat. And the boat basically just stops. But easing that sail, hoisting, and then move and then keeping going, you can see the boats just make way more progression down course and their speed never drops. It actually basically picks up as soon as the kite gets up. Um, also, if, if you do think that left side is favorite, I would get the kite up and then jive, unless there's whatever reason you need to get to that left side. Uh, but the boats that I think did the best were just actually just, just put the kite up and sailed for a while because there was um, nice 
breeze over on the right side, a little bit stronger breeze. And at the same time, you weren't almost stopping your boat doing a 180 spin around the mark. Um, so we'll watch. I actually have tons of videos of this. So this is um, going to see a lot of different stuff. This is actually a jibe. And I just wanted to point out, so the, the video quality, it didn't transfer over as well as I wanted it to um, when I was putting this together. But you can see someone down on the low side um, on Occam's razor grabbing the clue of that sail. So on an asymmetrical boat, I just thought this was a good example of a good, um, a couple of good key things you want to do when jibing an asymmetrical sail. So that, that person has probably been, been hauling the windward sheet around. And then once they've got the clue, they run it to the back of the boat. And then soon as the clue, basically you run it to the back of the boat, what you want to do is pull down on the leech and that helps invert the sail onto the new side and helps twist the sail. So it, it opens the sail up. Um, so that it's hard to tell in this video here, but you can see someone back there helping out. And then you can see the mainsail trimmer actually popping that full batten through the back stay. So, and then they were, they were, you know, they were, they came out of the, um, the jive a little bit hot and then they bared away and you can see the boat flattening there. So I thought that was overall pretty good jive. But the key thing is that, is that crew member um, that grabs that windward sheet, pulls it around, runs that clue to the back and then snaps the clue to open the sail. So I, I, I if you don't have someone doing that on, on a boat, you're running an H-Mental, I highly recommend you do it. To the next video. Uh, so here's two videos. The first one is a snuffer going up. I'm a big believer in snuffers. If you don't have enough people on a boat to get a sail up and down safely, a snuffer is a great way to get out there and use a flying sail. At the end of the day, you know, it's a little bit more weight. You got a bucket at the top of your sail. Uh, but if you can get that sail up and down more efficiently, that snuffer is worth it every time. Um, so I, I just thought that was a really good hoist. They got the snuffer up. They pulled the, the hoop up or the toilet seat, as I call it. It's at the top of the sail. They're off and going. They, they did not jive. They're still moving pretty well there. We got the next boat. And you can see here and all the way at the start of the video, they, they never, they, I don't know, for whatever reason. And if only the reason is they only have one halyard now. So they had to take their jib down to put the kite up. And that could be a very, you know, that could be a reason. Without having that jib up there, you can see the kite was getting away from them there. And the reason was the wind was behind them. If they had a jib, the kite would have been able to get to the top without filling. Um, so what helped prevent them kind of getting the kite really far away that the boat filled up, that's really hard to get the halyard up. Probably gonna have to put around a winch um, or get someone really strong to bump it up uh, before you can get to the top of the boat uh, or top of the mast. Uh, so I just thought that was pretty good. Good job with the snuffer and, and maybe try to keep the jib up. Uh, before you get the kite up, that'll help that, that sail from sailing away from you. Um, this is another rounding here. I think this one is, is this John? Might be. No, that's Excalibur. So Excalibur is um, they're they're sailing straight, and I just thought that this, that this was you know this was the this was the way to go. So I feel like whoever made this call, good job. Um, I think it just just kept you going down course a little quicker. You know, kite got up, see Jim's coming down. Okay, so that, that's the process. You can see the as soon as the kite loaded, you can see the boat almost healed over a little bit. It's a pretty big asymmetrical kite. Um, and and Jason kind of came down there to kind of flatten out the boat. But yeah, good good rounding, good good hoist. Uh, here comes serendipity. Um, so they're going for a hoist. Great job getting that kite up fast. Wow, that kite went up quickly. Um, jib furled right away. Came down a little bit here. I'm not sure what the reason was for that. Maybe they were thinking about jibing. Um, I'm not sure, but if Tom, if you would have just stayed up there a little bit higher, you would have kept going. I'm not 100% not sure what happened, but you can see there how that kind of slowed things down a little bit. But other than that, really good hoist, really quick. And great job furling that jib up. That was a really good job. So you can see here, this is cricket. One thing I want to talk about, and this is just to save the life of the sale so you don't have to come talk to me about getting new ones too often. 
uh leech line needs to be pulled on there it's fluttering it happens a lot in, in you know medium breeze especially when you ease off your sail and um you'll see that leech line in, or you see that leech flutter and basically you want to pull that leech line or else what will happen is the leech will flutter and if you're using a high modular sail like this the, the fibers tend to break down uh, and sometimes depending on how the leech is made the leech shape will turn into a hinge and actually just basically break the sail you see it happen a lot of times on mylar sails not as much anymore with the uh, 3D eyes, uh, but a laminated or mylar sail it will break down that mylar pretty quickly and you're going to end up ripping the leech off the back of your sail, taking years, years of life off your sail um, if you leave it. Um, so rounding here looks like, you know, they have the jibs or the kite bag set up on the starboard side. So you, you would think that they were going uh, into a jibe. They kept going, which isn't a bad idea, you know. Um, not sure why, but you know they kept their mow going for a little bit. Then they put in a jibe here, pretty big jibe in light air without a kite up. I probably would have got the kite up first. That's just my opinion. They might have saw something over on the left that I didn't see, you know. Um, so yeah, that's just my my only comments on that one. Coming in here, rounding. You know what I liked about this pull up. Okay, this is a symmetrical boat here. They've got their pole up already at the mark. Very good job. Kite starting to go up. Making sure that pole up first is so important. And getting the person just to whip that guy back. You almost sometimes want to pre-feed that guy. You know, get the guy out to the pole before the sail's actually going up. But they got that guy out there pretty good. Kite hoisted, fills right away. I thought that was a really good hoist. Almost a collapse, but they saved it. Good job, down, pulls back. They're heading down towards the finish line. Great rounding there. I think that was Frank and the, and the team. Here comes Nick again and Thursday's child. Pull up, awesome job. For guy pre-fed, you guys see that? Look how quickly this, this look at the, the kite is up before the mark. I think Nick was even worried about hitting the mark with the kite, which is never a good, good thing. Um, kites usually don't like marks, especially sharp ones like that. Maybe a little too wicked up there coming off the mark. I think we could have pulled back and down a little bit, but that hoist was awesome. Uh, really good job, Thursday Child team. Um, this is Fugitive ripping around the mark there, the far. Um, you know, good job. You know, they had to steer that much. They've slowed down a little bit, but not too much. But you can just kind of see how far Thursday Child has made it down the course relative to Fugitive, who's jive now and, and is still trying to get the sail up. Where, where Thursday Child had the sail up at the mark. Um, and Fugitive rounded right behind them, you know. Same thing with Jason, you know, big turn on that jive. You know, now you're fighting to get the main through. Good job with the main sheet trimmer getting it through that backstay. Um, Dusty Mock rolling in here um that's edward um maybe coming down a little bit early but he was he was getting the kite up there good job and, and he was continuing to go which which ended up being the play after uh and it's always very easy guys for me to say you know you should have went right you should have went left i gotta watch it all happen so i gotta watch 10 boats go left and a couple boats go a lot of boats did go left and a few boats went right and it just looked like it paid so you know who knows if i was on one of those boats i might have been you know, if I was a tactician, I might have been telling you to go left. It's very easy for me to be um, an armchair tactician there on my whaler. So, um, especially after I get to watch all these videos. Um, here comes the 92. So, yep, guy pre pre fed out there and a pole. Great job. You can do that symmetrical, asymmetrical. Kite's going up right at the mark. Really like it. You know, jib's still out, which is good. Kite's going up. And like at that point when the kite's going up, I kind of like that VMG mode where he's going super low. You know, you are you got to get down course. You know, sailing a hot angle away from the mark isn't a bad thing. The kite fills, head sail goes away. They're off and running. So a lot of the time, you know, it's not very good to be like, you're basically going the same. It's really going from a reach down wind if, if, the, if the finish line is directly downwind you know while you're getting the kite up the easiest way is to go directly downwind and get that kite up and once you get that kite up if you want to heat up to fill the kite or whatever but pointing at that finish line is probably the best vmg when you only have two sails up 
two upwind sails up, I should say. Here's the J120, Blue Joy. Tack out, awesome job. And you can see that they're actually going into, I think this is uh, a jibe hoist, okay? A jibe set, as they call it. One thing is the Genoa is probably, the Genoa trimmer is probably the same guy as the Spinnaker trimmer. Genoa got let go. They jived and ended up going around the front of the boat. So what you want to do is you want to make sure someone's controlling that head sail while you're going through the jibe. The boat really slowed down with the, with the kind of the alterization or the, the issue that was happening with the head sail there. You know, the kite's still going up, not full. Um, but saying that, you know, they kind of picked a game plan. I really liked how they had the, the sail set up to go up as soon as, you know, had the, had the guide preset. So they were prepared. You know, they had a little snafu with the head sail that probably slowed things down a little bit. But at the end of the day, they were prepared to get around that mark. Issues do happen, and it's how you deal with those issues when you're on the water and learn from them uh, for the next time to prevent them from happening again. So kites up. Um, we got the dash here rolling in. Rolling in right into a jibe. Okay, so same thing. Head sail was kind of pulled in a little bit more that time, so it didn't wrap around the force day. I'm right behind them, so it looked like they literally stopped. They did slow down, but I'm directly behind them, so you can't really gauge on anything, but they are still moving downwind. Um, it was a decent jibe, just, just you know, two head sails or two upwind sails sailing downwind, always difficult to get the boat moving. Um, so that actually, you know what guys, that, that, that was all, um, I really appreciate everyone showing up tonight. Um, I've got, actually, as I was saying, like a tons of pictures, some, some kind of, some pictures like, like this. Um, so I just want to thank everyone, um, for getting out there on that cold rainy day and having fun on the race course. Hopefully some people picked up some, some tips or some tricks or, or saw some things that they, they saw in their boat that they might change for next time or, or enjoyed the videos. I just want to say Merry Christmas from everyone at the North Sales team and, and Stellar J. I thought this was a pretty cool, uh, cool team here. Everyone was rocking Santa stuff, or at least the majority were. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I've sent out all these pictures and videos um, to Jen. If you want access to them, I'm going to put them on my Facebook page. Uh, feel free to email me, call me, text message me, Facebook message, Instagram, whatever. Any way you want to get in contact with me, pop by the lock. If you want to talk about any questions you have about this video or anything, uh, um, you know, my line's always open, always, always willing to talk about sailing and, uh, and hope to hear from you soon. If not, see you on the water sooner. Have a great night, guys, and Merry Christmas.